we are um, delighted to welcome Inger Anderson, who I see on the on video, and Jimmy Smith, the Director General of the International Livestock Report. We're here to talk to you about a fascinating report, a probably terrifying report, um, entitled Preventing the Next Pandemic, Zoonotic Diseases, and How to Break the Chain of Transmission. So, Inger, if you want to go ahead, and maybe we'll go to Jimmy Smith. And welcome to, to the briefing. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Stefan, um, Jimmy, and members of the media. Today actually is World Zoonosis Day, and so today we launch uh, UNEP, together with ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute, we launch a new report by the United Nations Environment Program and our partners at ILRI. The report is about the wider issue of zoonosis or zoonotic diseases, such as COVID-19, and how to minimize these diseases. So what does the report tell us? Well, COVID-19 is, as we all know, one of the worst zoonotic diseases in terms of its uh, rap rapidity with which it spreads. But it is not the first zoonotic disease. We also all know that. Ebola, SARS, MERS, HIV, Lyme's disease, Rifralli fever, Lassa fever are just a few that have preceded it. In the last century, in fact, we've seen around six major outbreaks of novel coronaviruses. And 60% of known infectious diseases and 75% of new emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in nature, i.e. they are derived from the animal world. For COVID-19, zoonotics caused economic damage of about 100 billion over the last two decades. This is not counting COVID-19. So tragically, 2 million people in low- and middle-income countries die each year from rather neglected endemic zoonotic diseases, such as anthrax, bovine tuberculosis, and rabies. There are often communities, these are often communities that are having other complex developmental problems uh, and challenges, and have a high dependence on livestock and or live in proximity to wildlife. Growth in humanity, our own expansion, and our activity is largely to blame. Meat production has increased about 260% in 50 years. We've intensified agriculture, expanded infrastructure, and extracted resources at the expense of our wild spaces. Dams, irrigation, and factory farms are linked to about 25% of infectious diseases in humans. Travel, transport, food supply chains have erased borders and distances, and climate change has contributed to the spread of pathogens. The end result is that people and animals, with the diseases that they carry, were closer together than ever. There are many solutions which will also help at the same time fight climate change and deal with and address biodiversity loss. Just a few to mention here. We need to invest in, one, ending over-exploitation of wildlife, and other natural resources. We need to farm sustainably. Three, we need to reverse land degradation. And four, we need to protect ecosystem health. Part of this process is the urgent adoption of integrated human, animal, and environmental health expertise, a policy which we have referred to over the decades as a One Health approach. Because One Health is not new, but unlike uptake um, but uneven uptake and institutional support means that it hasn't hit the potential that it holds. The weakest link in the chain of the One Health dimension is indeed environmental health. And we have to fix that. We were warned that the current pandemic was not a matter of if, but when. And it's a human failing that we predict, but we do not prepare. So now we must come... Uh, become more proactive to avoid another pandemic, and we must address zoonotic diseases. This means recognizing the in inextricably linked human health, animal health, and planetary health, that these three cannot be separated, and that we need to plan our responses accordingly. And if I may now, Stefan, hand over to my colleague, Jimmy Smith. Uh, you're muted. Thank you. Mr. Smith, go ahead. Yes, okay. Um, thank you, Stefan. I'm pleased to convey to the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, our thanks for offering us this platform uh, to join you here today. 
My name is Jimmy Smith, and I'm the Director General of ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute. ILRI is one of 14 international agriculture research centers known as the CGIAR that work towards a world free of poverty, hunger, and environmental degradation. I'm honored to be sharing the virtual stage today with Inger Anderson, the Executive Director of UNED. The report we are launching today is a careful and comprehensive assessment of zoonotic diseases and how to prevent them. It has been subject to a rigorous review by dozens of scientists and research organizations. But the central message is not that complicated. The key thing to understand about diseases like COVID-19 is that they do not emerge out of nowhere. They are not unpredictable events like earthquakes or asteroid hits. Instead, they are predictable consequences of the ever-intensifying interactions among humans, animals, and the natural world. The bad news is that these interactions are increasing for many reasons. Population growth, income growth, greater urbanization, and spreading human encroachments on the natural world, as Inga said. The good news is that we have a strategy that can reduce the risk of experiencing another pandemic on the scale of COVID-19. As Inger said, it is called the One Health Approach. It is premised on the idea that animals and human health and ecosystems they share are inseparable. Implementing that approach requires that we do three things. The first is that we must invest smartly. We estimate several years ago that a global investment of about 25 billion US dollars over 10 years in the One Health approach could generate benefits worth at least 125 billion over the same period. But that was an un underestimate. COVID-19 has taught us that the cost-benefit ratio is greater as we are now seeing that the pandemic could cost the losses in trillions of dollars and the human cost in terms of lives lost or damage is far still unknown. Second thing we must do is enhance disease surveillance. We need to create a global early warning system and the capacity to detect and stop diseases like COVID-19 before they become global pandemics. From global to local, we need to invest in veterinary, public health, medical and environmental services to be able to monitor and integrate information in real time. We need to focus on early detection, especially on animals, before humans become the sentinel species, the proverbial canary in a coal mine, alerting us to unforeseen dangers in the environment. The third thing we must do is collaborate like never before. COVID-19 is reminding us that pandemics are a global problem. The virus does not respect borders, and we need to address potential pandemics by working together at every level, from remote villages to global institutions. But it's not just about national borders we need to overcome. The virus requires that we collaborate across disciplinary boundaries as well. We we'll need to put aside our silos, disciplinary insularities, and find ways of deepening cooperation among experts in ecosystems, animal and human health areas. The One Health approach we're advocating isn't new, as Inga said. In fact, it's been around since the 60s. But chronic underfunding has limited the capacity of animal and ecological health systems to participate in One Health approaches. The report launched today highlights not only the importance of One Health, but also the need for greater financial and institutional support. And that is the final bit of good news that I want to share with you. COVID-19 has served as a global wake-up call and we're confident that the support we need would be forthcoming. At ILRI, for example, we're setting up a One Health Research Center for Africa. 
Its goal is to improve the health of humans, animals, and ecosystems by building capacity, strengthening local, regional, and global networks, and providing enhanced policy-based advice. So the opportunities are there to learn from COVID. And I'm confident that work like this report and the collaboration between institutes like UNEP and ILRI, we can ensure that global pandemics like COVID-19 could become a thing of the past. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to have been able to join you today. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. And um, our first question goes to E.D. Letterer of the Associated Press. Uh, thank you both very much for doing this briefing on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Welcome. Um, I have several questions. Uh, first, um, you talked about $25 billion that you put a price tag on uh, quite a few years ago. Um, Mr. Smith was quite optimistic about preventing this in the future. What kind of a price tag are you talking about now that could actually do this? And um, secondly, um, in terms of the actual origin of um, COVID-19, um, there's been um, a lot of speculation about wet markets and bats and other uh, pangolins. Um, what's the latest information that you have on the origin of uh, COVID-19? Thank you. Okay, which, uh, which one of the two of you would like to take out of the question? Ms. Anderson, just Anderson, Okay, perfect. Please. Um, I think, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get the correspondent from the UK's name, but thank you very much, madam. Uh, on, on the price tag, I will have to be honest, this has not been updated in terms of calculation. However, what we can see now is that investing in animal veterinary and environmental health is that including addressing some of the commitments that countries have already signed up to on illegal wildlife trade, i.e. stopping it, on sanitary condition in markets, etc. These would be uh, critical investments to enable um, on the nature side, and Mr. Smith can speak to on the domesticated animal side. But the point here is, I suppose, that it's a, it's a proportionate small bit compared to the trillions that we are now seeing lost in the global economy and having to be put on taxpayers, uh, 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 out of taxpayers' pocket to, to pockets to restart. With respect to the actual origin of COVID-19, we look upon this as, and obviously that's a WHO investigation and it's a health investigation. However, what we can say is this is a coronavirus. Uh, the other coronaviruses that we have known have emerged in wild or animals have often been transferred by an intermediary species, a bat, a rat, a pivot cat, or, or, or etc., and has thereafter uh, mutated either because of uh, proximity between species that have no business being in the same spot. Um, they are maybe supposed to live on different continents, but maybe in cages uh, in the same place, at any rate has mutated and become a, a human virus, a, a virus that susceptible to humans. I think at this point it would be too soon for us to speculate, but um, what, what we see from the prevailing um, early work that has been done is that it very much appear to have been um, a, an origin in, in, in the same manner as I described. Um, but that's clearly something that will need further investigation. The primary concern here is that veterinary um, sanitary conditions and appropriate handling of wild to domesticated to human uh, is what we need to be very careful about. The report speaks about seven drivers that tends to drive 
uh, increase uh, that we see as driving increases in zoonosis. One, our increasing demand for animal protein, so we've had the livestock uh, population go up. The two, unsustainable agricultural intensification. Three, increased use and exploitation of wildlife, often at times illegal. Uh, four, unsustainable urbanization and critical land use change. We fragmented nature. Um, five, extractive industries. Uh, and uh, six, increased travel and transportation. And then obviously supply food chains and climate change, which can increase pathogen spread. So these are the areas that the report speaks to. Um, I'll hand it back to you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smith, do you want to add? Would you like to add something? Very little on the etiology of the disease. As Inger said, this is still under consideration, and um, we don't know this uh, how it emerged perfectly. Um, so I, I don't have much more to say about that. It is also true that we have not updated the price tag on what uh, an, uh, an appropriate investment would be, but as Inger said, it would be a small percentage of the total cost of the ravage that we've seen from COVID-19. And it needs to be, that investment needs to be at least in a minimum standard of veterinary human and environmental health capabilities that can do uh, effective surveillance from village to institutional levels and, and across borders so that um, one can do surveillance in real time and be able to at least detect things that are known and be re relatively certain about strange things that we have not seen in the past. So a, a, a very small percentage of the co total cost of this COVID-19 would be sufficient to do that, although we have not um, updated the numbers recently. Could, Thank you, Madam. Could I ask a follow-up? Um on this this one health approach is this um something that's under the un umbrella is it under a global umbrella has everybody bought into it no this this would very much be an approach that each country must take um, to adopt the approach to build it across institutions to link it across borders um, uh, globally. Uh, and so that it requires a great deal of collaboration that is not, of course, um, mandated, but it's optional. And one hopes that after you've seen a tragedy such as this, there will be strong motivation to provide that collaboration that would allow us to build this sort of institutional disciplinary and other collaboration that, that I just mentioned. So no, it's not mandated under any particular organization, although the, the, the FAO, OIE, and WHO collaborate very closely in a sort of a One Health approach. But it will take the involvement of many, many of the countries around the world, not only the international organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions for our panelists? Okay. Unless you have a question. So I want to thank both uh, Inger and Mr. Smith very much for, uh, for coming on. And um, we hope to see you soon. And good luck with the report launch. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And to our journalist colleagues, we should have the executive director of UNAIDS on uh, shortly. So I'm just asking you to keep stay dialed on. Thank you.